I began the second half of my sophomore year feeling less worried about my family and more confident about school. My tia Chana, who was taking care of my father in Mexico, wrote to my mother, telling her that our father continued to be ill physically and mentally, but that with the help of a curandera, he was slowly recovering. She told my mother that he prayed for us every day. Roberto and his wife provided support and comfort to my family by visiting often and helping them out financially. My mother began working in a vegetable processing freezer during the week. Trampita kept on working as a custodian for the Santa Maria window cleaners, and my other siblings helped my mother work in the fields on weekends. I continued sending money home whenever I could. Besides taking 17 and a half units of coursework that second semester and enjoying all of my classes, I found a soulmate who made me feel more at home in college. I met Laura Facchini in the Survey of Latin American Literature too, taught by Dr. Hartman de Batista. Laura stood out in the small class because everyone else in it had taken the first part of that course the previous semester and because she was the only freshman and the only one who was not a native Spanish speaker. The other students were from Central and South America and the Caribbean. She caught my attention immediately when I saw her for the first time. She had big brown eyes, a light olive complexion, a high forehead, a narrow, slightly rounded chin, and short brown hair turned under. She reminded me of a girl with whom I was secretly infatuated when I was in junior high school. I always sat next to Lara because I seldom saw her outside of class, and when I did, she always seemed to be in a hurry, scurrying across campus, clutching her books and binders. One day she came to class a few minutes late, looking hassled. She sat down next to me and opened her Latin American literature anthology to the section on Ruben Darío, a Nicaraguan writer whose poetry we were to have read and studied for homework. I glanced over and saw that she had written in pencil numerous notes in the margins and the English translation of practically every Spanish word in the text. She caught my eye, smiled, and pulled her book closer to her and closed it halfway. I felt embarrassed and looked away. Professor Hardman de Batista made a few remarks about Darío and assigned each one of us a different poem to read aloud and analyze. I felt nervous and intimidated as I listened to students read with drama and confidence. However, I was surprised that Professor Hardman de Batista had to guide them so closely through the analysis. This was not the case with Laura. Even though she had a slight accent when she spoke, her reading was smooth and her interpretation impressed everyone, especially the teacher. At the end of the class period, I followed her out of the classroom. Where did you learn Spanish so well, I asked, trying to keep up with her fast pace. A light breeze pressed her floral cotton dress against her slightly bowed legs. Oh, I don't know Spanish that well. She glanced at me from the corner of her eye and smiled. But you do. I liked her modesty. I like Spanish and work hard at it. That's why I decided to major in it. I enjoy learning languages. I guess I'd take after my grandfather, who studies French and Spanish on his own. When I told her I was impressed with her interpretation of Rubén Darío's Canción de Otoño en Primavera, she explained that her high school English teacher had taught her how to analyze literature. I'm still struggling with English. I wish I knew Spanish as well as you know English. Maybe we can study together. We were approaching Nobili Hall. I'll help you with Spanish and you can help me with English. She frowned and said, well, here we are. Luckily, I don't have to climb too many stairs. I live on the second floor. Thanks for walking with me. You're welcome. See you in class. I opened the entry door and she dashed up the stairs. Maybe she thought I was being too forward. For the next few days, I did not walk with her after class even though I wanted to. Then to my surprise, I saw her come into the language lab in Varsity Library one evening. I was working there, setting up audio tape players, signing out audio tape cassettes, and closing the lab in the evenings. What are you doing here? I asked. Dr. Vary hired me to help out in the lab. I guess we'll be working together. This was music to my ears. 
It gave me a chance to see her more often. And as days went by, after we closed the lab, we spent time together sitting on the front steps of the library, sharing stories about our childhood. Once, I told her about my efforts to pick cotton when I was six years old. My parents used to park our old jalopy at the end of the cotton fields and leave me alone in the car to take care of Trampita. I hated being left by myself with him while they and Roberto went off to work thinking that if I learned to pick cotton, my parents would take me with them. One afternoon, while Trampita slept in the back seat of the car, I walked over to the nearest row and tried to pick cotton. It was harder than I thought. I picked the bowls one at a time and piled them on the ground. The shell's sharp prongs scratched my hands like a cat's claw and sometimes dug into the corner of my fingernails and made them bleed. At the end of the day, I was tired and disappointed because I had picked very little. To make things worse, I forgot about Trampita, and when my parents returned, they were upset with me because I had neglected my little brother, who had fallen off the seat, cried, and soiled himself. Poor Trampita, and you too, she said. And you too, she said. She buttoned her white wool knit sweater, looked up at the stars, sighed, and told me about how she helped her parents at their grocery store when she was six years old. The name of her family store, Hilltop Market, had a sign with a motto, not the biggest, but the finest. The customers were people who had moved from the rural south and Oklahoma and lived in modest houses tucked in the hills above the store in Brisbane, California. They would order a chicken every week for their Sunday dinner, and Laura and her mother would clean and package it for them. On Saturdays, customers would come into the store to pick up their order, or Laura's father would deliver the chickens along with the family's grocery orders to their homes. She said that her father bought the chickens from a poultry house in San Francisco, and that she would often go with him to see how the chickens were processed. The chickens were held in square cages about two feet high, stacked up four or five cages tall. Laura's father would pick out the chickens he wanted, and then the chickens would be delivered to a big, noisy room where they were killed and their feathers removed. All of this work was done by women who wore black rubber aprons, boots, and gloves. Once the feathers were removed, the heads and feet were wrapped in butcher paper, and the chickens were put in crates, and Laura and her father would bring them to the store. Laura would help her mother prepare the chickens according to the orders. They would cover the kitchen table with layers and layers of newspapers. Her mother would open the chicken, and she and Laura would carefully remove the intestines, heart, and liver. I used to play with the feet. By pulling on a tendon, I would make them move as if they were walking, she added, chuckling. Roberto, my older brother, used to do that, too. He would take the chicken feet and tell us it was a rooster's foot. He'd pull the tendon as fast as he could and chase my brothers and me around, hollering that it was the devil's foot. We thought it was so funny. Why would he say it was the devil's foot? Because it's a superstition that the devil has rooster's feet when he transforms himself into a man. Really? You don't believe that, do you? No, but some people do. Suddenly I realized I had interrupted her story. I'm sorry, I said. Finish telling me how you and your mom prepared the chickens. There isn't much more to tell. I think my mom was really proud that she could fill all the orders in time so people could have a nice Sunday dinner. She smiled, glanced at her watch, and said, It's getting late. We'd better do our homework. I walked her back to Nobili and watched her rush up the stairs. She and I continued sharing stories every day after we closed the lab. The more time we spent together the more I appreciated our friendship. I learned to trust her and developed a deep affection for her. Home away from home. My father did not allow my siblings and me to associate with kids who got into trouble. He used to say, Dime con quien andas y te diré quien eres. Tell me what company you keep and I'll tell you who you are. When Laura introduced me to her good friend, Emily Bernabe, I knew that Emily would become a friend of mine, too. Like Laura, she was a year behind me in college and was majoring in Spanish. And unlike most of the students at Santa Clara, she had a part-time job, lived at home, 
and commuted to school. We did not see each other on campus often, but when we did, we talked about our families. Her maternal grandparents, Margarito and Luz Cardona, left the state of Aguascalientes, Mexico, in 1920 with their five children and traveled by train to El Paso, Texas, and settled in Redwood City, California. They came to the United States to work and seek a better life for their children. Being the oldest child, Emily's mother, Juanita, had to drop out of the eighth grade to help her parents support the family. She eventually married and had two children, Gilbert and Emily. Gilbert was four years older than Emily. In the early 1950s, Emily's mother became a single parent and struggled to make ends meet, working in the Del Monte Cannery and Stokely's Packing House in San Jose. She often worked two and three jobs during the summer months so Emily and her brother could attend Catholic schools. One Friday, Emily and I talked about painful experiences we had in grammar school. I told her how I had failed first grade because I did not know English well enough and how I was teased because of my accent and how Roberto and I were not allowed to speak Spanish in school even though it was the only language we knew. Emily told me that she was never allowed to speak Spanish in school either. Her mother spoke English as well as Spanish, so Emily knew English when she started school. However, she felt hurt and insulted whenever kids pointed out the dark color of her skin. I told her that my mother thought that people who had prejudices were ignorant and blinded by the devil. Emily and I agreed. Ignorance was the devil. Emily invited Laura and me to her house for dinner that weekend. Saturday afternoon, she picked us up in front of McLaughlin Hall in her old blue Volkswagen and drove us to her house, which was about ten minutes from the university. I'm so glad to see you again, Laura. Bienvenidos, Juanita said, welcoming us. It's so nice to meet you, Panchito. I'm glad to meet you too, Mrs. Bernabe. She had curly, short black hair, a round face, brown, sparkly eyes, and a small, wide nose. Her gentleness reminded me of my mother's warmth. The small living room was sparsely furnished and neat, with family pictures on the walls. We sat at the kitchen table and ate my favorite meal, refried beans, rice, carne con chile, and freshly made flour tortillas. From the corner of my eye, I saw a molcajete a stone mortar on the kitchen counter. On the wall above it hung a Mexican calendar. I felt right at home. I visited Emily and her mother several times after that, and each time I felt as if I were with my own family. Paisano I saw Rafael Hernandez for the first time one afternoon on my way to class. He was in the corridor on the second floor of McLaughlin Hall, emptying a trash can into a cleaning cart, which held a trash bag, a sponge, and toilet supplies. It reminded me of the cart I used when I cleaned the gas company in Santa Maria. Hello, I said. He grinned and nodded. He had coppery skin, brilliant dark eyes, high cheekbones, and thick, straight black hair. After that day, we exchanged greetings every time we saw each other, but we did not meet until one Sunday morning at the Mission Church. I was attending Mass when I spotted him sitting a few pews in front of me. After the service ended, I went up to him and introduced myself. He recognized me but seemed tense and reserved. When I spoke in Spanish and told him that my father was from the state of Jalisco in Mexico, his eyes lit up. Nuestros padres son paisanos, he said, smiling. Our fathers are fellow countrymen. My father was born in Lagos de Moreno. We strolled through the mission gardens, talking in Spanish about our families and work. He said that he had recently started working as a janitor at Santa Clara after having worked in the fields, picking fruits and vegetables in the San Joaquin Valley and Salinas. When I told him that I too had worked in the fields and as a janitor, he was surprised. The lines etched on his brow became more pronounced. How did you manage to go to college, he asked. I got some scholarships and loans, and my family has made many sacrifices for me to be here. You are so lucky to have those opportunities here, he said. It's a lot more difficult in Mexico. When we arrived at my dormitory, he pointed out that he lived only two blocks away in a small house. 
From that day on, we chatted a few minutes every time we ran into each other. He was born and raised in Paredones, a tiny village near Guadalajara, Mexico. When his father died, he dropped out of school and took a job to help his widowed mother make ends meet. Rafael and his mother took a long bus ride every day to go to work for a wealthy rancher. She worked as a maid and he as a ranch hand. Eventually, Rafael got married and started his own family. He had two children, a boy and a girl. When he lost his job and his wife became gravely ill, he decided to leave his wife and two children under his mother's care and head for the United States, hoping to find work to pay for his wife's medical expenses and support his family. He took a bus to Juarez and with the help of a coyote, crossed the border to El Paso. From there, he made his way to the San Joaquin Valley, to Salinas, and then to Santa Clara. Several weeks after we first met, he invited me to his home, which was a rented room in a small, white, wooden house located on a corner street. He said he had something to tell me and a gift to give me. The entrance was on the south end of the white, wooden structure. Aquí tiene su casa, he said, welcoming me and offering a wooden chair for me to sit on. The room had no windows and a sweaty and salty odor. In the back corner was a small kitchen table. On top of it were an electric hot plate and two dented pots and a pan. Underneath it was an aluminum wash basin, a stack of canned foods, soft drinks, and a box of macaroni. A calendar with a picture of the Virgen de Guadalupe hung above his cot, which was pushed against the wall. A wooden crate full of books and magazines with a Del Monte label on it was next to his bed. He sat on a three-legged wooden stool to the right of the entrance. As usual, he wore khaki pants and a blue, long sleeve cotton shirt, slightly open at the neck. I'm glad you came. I couldn't leave without saying goodbye to you. Leaving? Why? I was shocked and disappointed. I'm going back to Paredones. I miss my family and my country. I've been sending money home every month to pay the doctor, and thank God my wife has recovered. Life is too hard for us in this country. There are people here who think that we Mexicans are no more than animals. In Texas, I saw signs in restaurants that said, no Mexicans or dogs allowed. It's humiliating. Yes, it is. His words reminded me of Diaz, a labor contractor I had known. He tried to force a bracero to pull a plow like an ox, and when he refused, the contractor had him deported back to Mexico. But we endure for the sake of our children, he said, with a spark in his eyes. He crossed himself three times and added, and thanks to the Virgen de Guadalupe and the good Jesuit priests of Santa Clara, I am now able to return home and be with my family. I was happy for him and glad his wife was fine now, but sad to see him go. He stood up, went to the Del Monte box and picked up a worn book and handed it to me as a gift. Thank you very much, I said, glancing at the title, La Patria Perdida, wondering why the author named it The Lost Homeland. A good friend of mine gave me this novel and begged me not to come to the United States. She said her father died in the desert trying to cross the border, and she didn't want me to have the same fate. The author lived in San Antonio, Texas a few years, and while he lived there, he experienced discrimination, and like me, he missed his homeland. He wrote about this in his novel, so when you read it, think of me. I will. It's a great gift. Thanks again, I said. We said goodbye and promised each other to keep in touch. I never saw or heard from him again, but I felt grateful for having known him. He helped me to better understand my father's own yearning for his homeland and his long-held dream of returning to Mexico with our whole family.